Welcome to People Doing Good for Others. This is People Doing Good for Others, where we celebrate and highlight holding the light those who truly matter in our communities. I'm Gary York, and I'm grateful to be with you today. I want to thank Wilkes Communications, River Street Networks, and WIFM for this opportunity. And again, the gratitude is uh, part of my heart, and I thank you very much. Our preacher guest today will be the Honorable Dale Falwell. He's our state treasurer. He's uh, been, this is the end of his first term and he will be running here in a few weeks for his second. He's a gifted public servant, a person of uh, tremendous honor and integrity and willingness to take a stand on those difficult things that uh, are challenging in our state. And so thank you for being with us and uh, uh, stay with us because this is going to be a great day. Thank you very much. And uh, Dale Falwell, thank you for being on People Doing Good for Others today. And so say hello. Well, thanks for having us. You know, we used to shake hands, but now we have to do this uh, this we'll time. But it's really great to, to be with you back in Wilkes County and you know, it, it, it's hard to go past the barn. Uh, my barn is in Winston-Salem where I live. And, you know, horses don't like to go past the barn. They like to stop. Yeah. But uh, really glad to be with you this morning. And as far as doing good for others, we, with all the angst and stress and anxiety that people have in their lives today about uh, COVID-19, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we've, the flattening of the health care curve, but there's going to be a lot of attention over the next few minutes about how we to attempt to flatten the economic curve sure. that is affecting people uh, and their insecurity about job and food and education as well as health. Dale Falwell, go back to uh, those moments when you were called to serve. And uh, I know you had a great successful career in business mm -hmm. and investments and doing, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, uh, putting things together for your mm -hmm. family. Sure. Now you're giving it back. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, that calling, if you will, and knowing you, you had this thing about wanting to matter in the lives of others. Well, uh, you know, doing good for others, I'm like yourself, or I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of people who expected the best out of me. It wasn't always easy, but they also wanted the best for me. And I'm very blessed to have those folks and, and memories uh, in my life. And uh, my call to serve really came from the fact that for a third of my life, I was a blue collar worker. I was a garbage collector in Forsyth County. I was a motorcycle mechanic in, in Winston-Salem and in Greensboro. And, and uh, so I, I like fixing things. Uh, that's what you do as a mechanic. And uh, there's nothing that needs more fixing right now than government. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a matter of, uh, you know, when you work on a motorcycle, you know, you listen, you act, and you fix. And uh, that's what I've tried to do through my public service career, both uh, as a member of the Forsyth County School Board for eight years, uh, eight-year member of the General Assembly, uh, as a member of the House of Representatives, uh, three years uh, fixing the broken, broken unemployment system back in 2013, uh, and now as the keeper of the public purse and the state treasurer. And uh, when you think about the responsibilities for your viewers, uh, the state treasurer, just the pension plan, which we'll talk about in the this or in the next segment, it is four times larger than the state budget. And it four times. Larger. Just, just the pension plan. And everything that we manage at the treasurer's office is eight times larger than the state budget. And the pension itself is the 26th largest pool of public money in the entire world, not just in the United States. And there's nearly one out of 10 adult North Carolinians, many of your viewers, who are teach, protect, and otherwise serve who either depend or intend or will be depending on the, the pension plan. So, you know, uh, all this stuff connects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've been together before, yeah. and we did not talk about your professional career. Just right. a <coughs> overview on that 
segment of your life before public service? Well, I was a very unlikely person to ever go uh, to UNCG to start with. I'd, I had a high school diploma from Versailles County, but I'd really left school every day at 10 o'clock uh, from the night 10th grade on to go work jobs, second, second shift job at Coca-Cola, for example. So uh, I've, I've made my living for, most, for a third of my life with my hands and my back and my feet. And if you do that for a long enough period of time with your hands, your back, and your feet, sometimes it sends a signal to your brain <laughs> to change your heart about getting more educated. And <clears throat> so I'm thankful for, to the folks at UNC Greensboro. I ultimately graduated in three years with an undergraduate degree in accounting, took and passed all parts of the CPA exam on the first sitting, got a master's degree in accounting when I went to work for an investment banking, uh, investment uh, management firm, uh, Alex Brown and Sons, and then uh, retired from there in 1998. And then I was, uh, I was off to my, the phase I'm in now, which is public service. And you, was the uh, school board, Correct. Was that the, uh, is that where we started? That's where we started, and uh, I served with uh, Superintendent Don Martin, yeah, yeah. Uh, who you have a, a great relationship with, who's been on your show before. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, he is not only a uh, member of the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners now, but he, I've also appointed him to the State Health Plan Board of North Carolina. And uh, his, uh, his ability to analyze things, he goes from A to Z, about as quick as John Force does in a drag race car, yeah. uh, Dr. Yeah. Martin does. and yeah. uh, He's amazing. Really having, uh, grateful to have him because the state health plan is, has 720,000 participants in it who we talked about the people who depend on the pension. These are people who now depend on the state health plan for health care and pharmaceutical services. And, and to give your viewers a context, what does 720,000 mean? That is equivalent to the number of people in the United States who work for Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, Jamie Dimon's J.P. Morgan, and Jeff Bezos's Amazon combined. 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 Wow. A lot of buying power. A lot of buying power. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's revisit school board. Sure. And <coughs> just uh, some of the things maybe that. Uh, helped you along the way when those eight years sure. that uh, you learn from people and how things work behind the scenes. So talk about public education. You're a real product of that and you believe in it wholeheartedly. I do. And uh, that's really where my fear is right now. I, I think that this, this economic, this, this healthcare virus has the potential of creating an economic inequality in North Carolina, especially as it relates to public education. Uh, we have a, a thousands, thousands of people, even in Forsyth County, who are not logging on to these uh, online classes. And imagine what might be happening in some parts of rural North Carolina that don't have quite the access to broadband as, as you um, have available, you know, through Wilts sure. Communication. Yeah. So I'm very concerned about uh, public education and uh, very concerned that this virus could create an economic inequality, not just among groups of people, but among regions of North Carolina. You know, we have two cities in the southern part of North Carolina. One's called Shalote and one's called Charlotte. You know, <laughs> they're spelled similarly and they sound similar. But I can tell you that from an ed education, from a economic, uh, and that Shalote and Charlotte are in far different boats today as they're trying to conquer what COVID-19 is doing to our economy. Before we uh, commence this session, sure. you were on an interview mm -hmm. on the coast about a storm last night. Yeah. Tell us how that uh, maybe connects to where you are professionally sure. as our state treasurer right now. Uh, I was on an interview this morning uh, w about the storm that happened on Monday, Monday. The, the, the hurricane. But okay. it, it was it was with a group that was in Brunswick County uh, in Ocean Isle, and uh, the way that the, that impacts the, the treasurer's office is number one to assure people, you know, which is the name of your show, doing good for others, mm -hmm. uh, that we remain in the check delivery business even when we're working remotely at the treasurer's office because of COVID nineteen and they're facing their challenges. To just let them know that, that our, our prayers and hearts are, are with them as they 
tried to get out of their uh, the storm, it, uh, the, the aftermath of the storm. And it go, really goes back to a question I didn't fully answer about the, about the school board. At, at the end of the day, public service is about it, it, every point you can, push the power down to the common sense of the individual. The more opportunities we have to push the power down to the common sense of individuals, you know, the better outcomes we're going to be have. Uh, and the second, voters, vo yeah, and and just citizens. Okay. But the other thing is to conduct yourself with in integrity, ability, and passion. And what I've learned as a blue collar worker is that people, the the world will help you with passion a little bit, and the world will help with the joy of achievement and upward mobility, and the joy, and then the world will help you with increasing your ability to do things. But generally speaking, the world cannot help you with your integrity. You know, integrity is what you do when no one's watching. And you could be a superstar at ability and passion, but if you don't have integrity, eventually you will not matter. Right. And that's something I've learned all through my life, and it's never been more important than as a public servant. I first met you at the dedication of the Wilkes County Cooperative Extension building, yes. and we were uh, among some of the tremendous leaders in our community mm -hmm. and then uh, Trooper uh, Bullard's uh, uh, funeral mm -hmm. and uh, I can remember you standing there uh, watching the procession go mm -hmm. by and I, and I said, you know, there's a public servant and uh, what an honor to have you in Wilkes County that day. So uh, would you reflect on those two moments for me? Department of Commerce on the first one, uh, and that's where Steve Troctor, Steve Troxler, the Agriculture Commissioner, informed people that uh, Wilts County was number three in the state as far as corn production, but he didn't think they're counting all the corn. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> okay, I have a good memory. Uh, but the second thing, obviously, very sad about Trooper Bullard, and it, it's just a reminder. Um, and I, I still get choked up, you know, his, the anniversary of his death was just a, a few months ago. Uh, I still get choked up about the fact, and the reason I was standing there on 421 and not part of the processional is that I wanted everyone, they, they don't know who I am, and that doesn't matter. I know who they were. And they were people who had lost a, a, a fiance, a son, that I, I've been through the same ordeal, losing our son, uh, uh, a public servant, a person killed in the line of duty, a, a, a comrade in, with the highway patrol. And I just wanted to see all the cars that came by. Uh, and plus wanted all, to see the cars. The, the, the cars that represented the people whose hearts were broken. And, and, wow. and all the other support that came in from outside of Wilkes County to, 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 to pay tribute to, to Trooper Bullard. And it's also a reminder that, and I hope this comes across clearly for your viewers, is that at the Treasurer's Office, with all these $200 billion that we manage, at the end of the day, we're in the check delivery business. And sometimes some of the checks are blessings, like you retire from the state, you've taught, you've protected, or you've served. Uh, or, and sometimes some of the checks are, are not blessings, which are checks that go out to beneficiaries of public servants who have been killed in action or have otherwise passed away. So at the end of the day, we're in the check delivery business. No one calls the treasurer's office to book a cruise. They call the treasurer's office because they have a life-changing event. And that's what we think about every day at the treasurer's office and how we deal with these folks compassionately and with, a, with a, the highest degree of loyalty, and we deal with them fairly and justly. We don't pick and choose which laws we apply right. to the beneficiaries of these plans, and we don't pick and choose who we apply them to. Uh, we treat the custodian the same th the way we would the chief of police. Yes. So, so you grew up uh, challenged, and, and we're making your own way mm -hmm. Uh, day by day, as, as, as we could, and then uh, the the calling to go back to school. Mm -hmm. uh, can you will you share that with us? I can, and uh, and before I do so, I won't 
all your viewers to know that they're also standing on the shoulders of somebody too. Right. And it's their responsibility maybe after this show that they go and tell those folks that have been meaningful to them, whether they're with us or not with us anymore, yeah. in some way, shape or form, just yeah. to thank them. But I was a garbage collector for Forsyth Garbage Service, uh, and that was owned by the Tuttle family down in, in, in from King, but off of Indiana Avenue. I was rolling the orange garbage barrels up and down Shadlong Drive, throwing them in the side of the high side loader truck. And, you know, people look at me, Gary, and ask me if I've ever lifted weights. And I said, not the kind you think of. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you know, when you pick up 80, 90 gallons of wet garbage, you're lifting weights. There's a lot of weight there. Yeah. And uh, I came back in after doing that about two years. Um, and uh, the owner, his name was Larry, said, uh, it's time for you to go. Now, I had a, a mortgage to pay for, I had a mother to take care of, and had two other jobs on top of that job. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you've got too good a head on your shoulders, you need to go to school. I did not know this, Gary, and I hope I don't get choked up saying the story. I did not know this till four years ago, when I was given his eulogy, did I realize in the early 60s, he got called home from Appalachian State University to run the business because his father had gotten sick and he was never able to complete his degree. Brilliant businessman. And he was pushing me out the door. <coughs> this is an example of wanting the best out of you, but expecting wanting the best for you. And I didn't know that till he, his eulogy when his family told me the story of why he did that to me. And so with that, I walked into UNCG and uh, they have had a, a probation. It's the only time I've been on probation, Gary. I want to say that for the record. <laughs> they have a probationary program at that time called the Adult Student Learning Program. And uh, they uh, let me come in on a probationary basis as long as I signed up for classes, paid for the classes, attended the classes, and made, and, and, and made certain grades. And uh, that's how it all got started. Wow. And then you said out of there in three years? I made up a year of high school. High school? No, I, because I'd never taken a foreign language, never taken but one history course, only one math course, only three English courses, and four years of high school. Things are much, you viewers out there, you high schoolers are looking at all the requirements now to graduate from high school. It's far different than the late 70s in, Ver, in Versailles County. So I had to make up about a year of high school and then, and then finished in three and a half years and worked 70 hours a week while I was taking all that course load and took some classes at Winston-Salem State because it was, I had to watch the pennies and the paper clips and you know, a, a bullion cube and being able to heat water was sometimes a big deal to me. Uh, and, uh, but wow. I'm, I'm grateful to be sitting here as, as I said earlier, probably the most unlikely person to ever be the state treasurer of North Carolina. As I uh, spent several hours preparing for today, yes. uh, a statement that you said, I was poor in resource, but rich in opportunity. Mm -hmm. Visit that for me. Well, it just goes back to everything that I've said that, and that's one of my other fears about what COVID is doing to our economy is that it's, it's destroying hope. Destroying hope. And it's destroying the joy of achievement. And only through, and the joy of achievement is the strongest. There's no alcohol and there's no drug stronger than what the joy of achievement makes you feel like. There's nothing stronger than the joy of achievement. And when you have the joy of achievement and you connect that with a, 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 some plan about how to get upward mobility in your life. Right, okay. That's, that's what I meant by poor in resource, but you know, rich in opportunity. Okay. But you, you have to, in order to achieve that, you have to know what you don't know. You have to be willing for people to coach and school you, take their advice, and learn from mistakes. You know, none, none of us on God's earth are perfect, but there's everybody on this earth that has some perfect part about them that they're really good at. Yeah. They may have parts of their life that are really, you don't really admire, but just try to learn and emulate from those things that you do. State Treasurer Dale Falwell, uh, the opportunity to be our mm -hmm. State Treasurer mm -hmm. and uh, seeing that how you could be a, a, the leader and, mm -hmm. and bring change about. 
uh, you were had been in the legislature uh, in several different positions. Sure. Uh, uh, let's talk about getting ready to be the state treasurer <laughs> that year before and right. the things that you maybe could see that this needs fixing. Well, there, there, there's a lot. You know, number one is that the, the things I wake up thinking about in the mornings are hopefully things that your viewers don't wake up and think about in the morning. You know, I wake up and think about assume rates returned, life expectancies, uh, AAA bond ratings. I hope that most of your viewers are waking up uh, thinking about how we're going to best educate our children. Yes. How are we going to have good business and job opportunities? Uh, how are we going to have safe communities? And But see, everything that happens at the treasurer's office connects back to what they wake up and think about in the morning, which is, you know, public education, public safety, public works, and public roads. And so, you know, the challenges that we face at the treasurer's office is, uh, is, the, is number one, trying to maintain North Carolina's AAA bond rating. Now, for your viewers, a, a AAA bond rating to the state is like a credit score to them. Okay. Or like yeah. a sanitation grade at Cagney's that I ate breakfast at this morning in, in Wilkesboro. Uh, it's, a, it's a measure of quality. So any time that the state has a AAA bond rating, that means that we're able to borrow money at the lowest possible interest rates. And I know there's a lot of divisiveness in our community and in our state and our country right now, but I can almost assure you, Gary, 100% certain that there's at least one thing that people agree on. And that is if you have to borrow money to build schools or for public safety or public works or, or public roads, if you have to borrow money, being able to do it cheapest, as cheaply as possible allows you to get more of whatever it is you're borrowing on. Being yeah. able to borrow money at lower interest rates lowers the cost of buying whatever it is you are buying, public schools, public safety. So the AAA bond rating is very important. And all these other factors, management of the pension plan, management of the state health plan, uh, we're the state banker, so management of the financial operations division, uh, chair of the local state and local government commission, which regulates the issuance of over debt by over 1,300 entities like Wilkes County and Wilkesboro and North Wilkesboro and all the cities and counties that your viewers live in, the airports, the hospitals, the universities, uh, water and sewer districts, all those entities have to come through the treasurer's office and the state and local government commission to be able to borrow money. So that's that's how all of that in, in Wilkes County terms ticks and ties. So if we have a bond ties. issue to build some schools, <coughs> yeah. that is, that's what you're saying. Yes, right. The the Wilkes County would come to the state and local government commission. They would present their plan uh, of why this is necessary, why it's advisable, and what their intention is to pay the money back. You know, anytime you're approving the debt on anyone, you want to know what is your plan for paying it back. So, uh, the county commissioners will, uh, with conjunction with the school board here, will work out a resolution asking the state and fill out an application, the state and local government commission. We have a meeting once a month, which includes a state auditor, the secretary of state, the secretary of revenue, and myself and about three other members. Of Is the, that the council? The uh, council yes, of yeah. government? No, that's the council of state. Council of state. So this is a, I have 21 major statutory and constitutional duties and responsibilities. I was going to ask you yeah, about no, that. This is one of them. Okay. So this is the state and local government commission. So it's for the issuance of debt by the state or any local government, uh, and that they all come through the okay. SLG. When they get a thumbs up, then the county works with a, fi a uh, financial advisor to get the bonds issued. They go to Wall Street and they get a rating and they sell the bonds. So, you know, that's why all this really matters. Okay, I want to. Switch gears just sure. a little. Yeah. I'm a motorcycle. Working, I'm a motorcycle been, rider, so I, I love switching on a, gears. Uh, yeah. a prison yeah. that closed and yeah. the the impact on the community and right. uh, not being able to pay them. Uh, share that miracle with us. Uh, if well, you will. if you were to drive from here and you need to have a lot of coffee, but if you were to drive from here to the Outer Banks today, you would go through Terrell County which is the last county you go through before you cross the sound into the Outer Banks. And the number of people in Terrell County is equal to 
the number of students and faculty at Myers Park High School in Charlotte. My goodness. The number of people, and this goes to something I hope we can have a moment to talk about, is the how depopulated some of these communities have gotten over the last 20 years. And in some of your counties that this show goes out to, not just the depop the less people, but what's happened to the median income of the people who remain. So when you go through Terrell County, there's about 4,000 residents. Well, years ago, the state came in and wanted to build a prison. So what we're getting ready to talk about is not an act of God, not an act of COVID, but an act of the state. They came in and wanted to build a prison, but they needed a, a reverse osmosis water system because it's on the coast in order to, 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 uh, to have good, fresh, clean water and sewer for not just the prison, but the whole county. So this county with 4,000 people in it went and borrowed millions of dollars to build this water treatment system. And it's the fifth best water in quality in the United States. That's how fifth good, best. That's how good the water is. Number one in North Carolina, fifth best. So the state decided last fall to shut the prison and, and move the prisoners to Pasquotank and Bertie County, which is the, the counties to the north. And when they did this, and I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to be silly about this, they shot a 30-foot hole through the finances of the water and sewer system because there's not toilets being flushed and no showers being taken. So the biggest customer of that water and sewer system that took on all this debt in this poor county left. And it, the county was not going to be able to make its bond payments. We just talked about bonds. Yes. So on June 1st of this year, two months ago, they were not going to be able to make their bond payment. So what do I have to do with Terrell County? I don't live in Terrell County. I don't have any relatives in Terrell County. Because I started looking at this situation, I said, if this can happen in Terrell County, if this can happen to the least among us, the least, then what could happen elsewhere? So I got involved uh, with the county commissioners, uh, uh, Chairman Everett and uh, County Manager Clegg, and the County Commissioner Association and the League of Municipalities because the city of Columbia, which is the county seat of that county, uh, the city of Columbia was also having problems because they provide the sewer to the prison. And uh, we figured up how much the water bill and sewer bill would have been is $302,000. So I telegraphed to the governor that I don't care if you don't flush the toilets or use the showers, you need to pay the bill because this was an act of the state and please find the $302,000 to give to this community for what they would have gotten if you hadn't made that decision so they can make their bond payment. And to the administration uh, did do that, so I'm very grateful. But that just gets us you know, eight or nine months down the road. So now what we're really working on is to get the prison reopened because the prisons in Bertie and Pasquotank have gotten very overcrowded because of this other prison just closed. Right. And this is one of the work farm prisons. There's 300 acres of the most fertile land in North Carolina around this prison. So it was producing food, not just for the prisoners to eat, and but also producing food for other prisons in that neck of the woods. So uh, we're, we're gratified at, at this short-term fix, but it made me realize that there's a lot of stress going on in rural North Carolina, and especially rural North Carolina between Raleigh and the Atlantic Ocean. Honorable Dale Falwell, <clears throat> um, oversight of that, your department, mm -hmm. the, the state treasurer, those mm -hmm. uh, immediately, so in, in Raleigh, mm -hmm. if you will, let's talk about how how significant, not how, how big it is, and how many people serve it. Well, we, uh, as I said earlier, we have uh, nearly a million people in the pension plan. Uh, that pension plan is paying out $530 million every 30 days. Every 30. 530 million. Every 30 days. That's over six and a half billion uh, per year. So we have a lot of folks who have taught, protected, or otherwise served their community or the state who really depend on this pension plan. Uh, the state health plan has 720,000 participants in it. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also the state banker. Uh, so our duties and responsibilities, we're keepers of the public purse. And uh, this lapel pin that I'm wearing 
uh, Gary used to belong to uh, Harlan Bowles, and Harlan Bowles right. was considered the mm. best state treasurer of the 20th century in the United States, not just in North Carolina. And, uh, and Harlan Bowles wrote a book called Keeper of the Public Purse, and on page 143 of that book, now anytime that I'm in the presence of Richard Petty, the king, Anytime I mention one and 43 in the same sentence, he loves it right. because he's still, he's still number <laughs> one. Um, page 143 of this book, the former treasurer says, the state treasurer in North Carolina has more constitutional and statutory responsibilities and duties than any other elected official in the state except for the governor. So I asked his son one time, I said, wonder why, and the, and the author, Charles Heatherly, uh, why he said except for the governor. And he said, because the governor has command of the National Guard, and that, and that is a very serious responsibility. So uh, I chair the State Banking Commission, which regulates all the state chartered banks and savings and loans in North Carolina. I'm one of two voting elected members of the state school board, one of two voting elected members of the community college. I'm the chair of the local government commission. I chair the pension board. I chair the defined contra the uh, 401k board, the state health plan board, the debt affordability commission. Um, and those are just eight of the 21 major responsibilities that the treasurer has. What an honor to have you with us today, uh, Dale Falwell, and your servant's heart is, uh, is so apparent in all that you say and you do, and I'm grateful for that. Well, thank you, and I just want to tell your viewers that I believe that God made everyone on this earth possibly better at, at something than anyone else, not better than anyone else but better at something. something. And it's their responsibility to find out what that is. God bless you. <clears throat> Gary York, people doing good for others. We've been honored today to have the Honorable Dale Falwell, a significant community servant, a person dedicated to helping the least of these, the least of us, and those who uh, are uh, Terrell, Terrell County, and that story I shall always cherish. Thank you for being with us, and until we can meet again, have a safe week, and uh, make sure that all of our family members are pulling together for the best of all. Thank you.